So we take a few minutes to sit together and I thought it would be nice for us to reflect on joy this evening. So as we're sitting, instead of what is often our habit to notice what's bothering us, simmering regrets or irritations or whatever it might be. It's almost like we learn to look through those difficulties and notice what else is here in the moment. Like here at the retreat center, we had a thunderstorm just kind of skirted us. So we hear the rumbling in the distance now. And we hear the singing of the crickets. And after having the air conditioning on in the afternoon, we have the big patio door doors open so we can hear the outside sounds. And for those of us in this space, it might be possible to simply appreciate these conditions, not making them more than what they are, not whipping them up to be something super special. For some of you others at home, it might be that your cat or dog is curled up near you. And just appreciating that living being, their goodness, their proximity, the friendship that you share. We really like your chair. It can be quite ordinary. It's a really generous thing, how our chairs support our body, how they hang in there with us. No matter how much we might complain about them, they don't seem to complain about us. <laughs> or you might have your shawl that you like. You might like the temperature of the room. Maybe you had some nice soup for dinner and it's sitting nice in the belly. So just see what is available for you now so that when bringing your attention to it as it actually is, so you're not manufacturing anything, and the great diversity of our experience right now. What is it so that when we bring our attention to it, there is some of that delight of joy, even if it's quite refined or subtle, there's that joy of appreciation, of gratitude, even for some experiences a little of that sense of awe or wonder. May the goodness of this life, may the beauty of this world, the reality of friendship, may all this goodness that I can touch into, may it continue and increase and never end. So we're making this a particular theme in the sense of specifically keeping in mind things that 
lead to joy, things that are the supporting causes for joy, that lightness of heart, that buoyancy, that sense of upliftment to occur. And it doesn't really matter what it is. You might be hearing the sounds of your children in a room nearby. And in other moments, it might bother you, but looking at it in a particular way, it can be a cause for joy. Their laughter, their play, whatever it might be. And each time you touch in to some ordinary goodness, beauty, joy, and just have that sense in this changing world, this uncertain world, may this joy continue, may it increase, may it never end. And we don't expect perfect unending joy, but the energy of appreciation of joy is that expansive, may this continue, may it increase, may it never end. Not so much this particular joy, but this capacity to recognize and appreciate what's good. Because this can happen even when the circumstances are quite difficult. Our fearlessness can be recognized, courage, the persistence, a sense of humor. There's always goodness to be recognized. So may, why not, why not wish that it continue and increase and never end? So remember, this is a creative meditation. You are needing to be personally involved connected, keeping joy in mind creatively, finding it where it is, actually is for you now. And then wishing that it continue, increase, never end. And really feel that capacity of the heart to delight, to expand with joy. We're not denying the very real truth of suffering. We're just choosing for a time to keep joy in mind. So do the best you can and let that be good enough.
May this goodness continue and increase and never end. The goodness that we're recognizing may continue and increase and never end. It's a good time to appreciate the goodness of your friends, your family, letting the goodness touch our hearts and the heart responds with that beautiful wish. May your goodness continue and increase and never end.
And we can even just feel the energy of this body, the sitting body. And again, we're not pretending anything's perfect, but just feeling the life energy here, the vibration of life, the vitality, the strength of the body, the resilience of the body, really the culmination of so much evolutionary intelligence right here. May all this goodness, all this skill, all this resilience continue, increase and never end. Just grateful for this life the resilience of this life. May this goodness continue, increase and never end. Grateful for our community, those of you online, those of you here at the retreat center, that we can gather like this, that we have these teachings, to gather around these practices. May the wholesomeness of all of this and all the generosity that supports this, may all this goodness continue and increase and never end. And all the good healing all the deepening of wisdom and kindness that is happening. I know it's not perfect. Two steps forward, one step back or whatever, but it's worthwhile appreciating the good work that we're up to here, all of us in our own ways. May this good work sometimes difficult, sometimes joyful work of the path. May it continue, may it increase, may it never end this goodness. And our heart's capacity to smile and appreciate the wild uncertainty of our lives. May this resilience, this sense of wonder, may this goodness continue and increase and never end. Take a moment, adjust your body, stretch a little if you'd like. So as I mentioned, I thought it'd be nice to talk about joy and um, actually it's, it's a really important part of the Buddhist teachings and there are lots of different angles and reflections on joy in the Buddhist teachings. It's not like a, something we tag on, it's really central to the path. 
I think it's quite fair to say there's really no awakening without understanding joy. It's the flavor of joy that helps us find our way right from the very beginning. It's like the Buddha says, it's, there's joy, there's that taste of freedom, that flavor of release in the beginning, in the middle, and the end. And I was, uh, it's fun to see, I haven't given this talk in a while, and uh, there's some interesting research that I came off, came upon. I mean, that's been going on for decades. And different social scientists looking at ecstasy and, and other kind of uh, peak experiences. Some of you have heard that term by Maslow and other people have their different ways of studying, including, um, some recent studies where they've looked at um, some of what astronauts have said because you know when they're out in space and they're looking at the planet it's a it's a pretty pronounced experience of vastness like out of the box seeing the little blue planet and uh, and it brings up or is a cause a supporting cause at least for the heart being moved, whether you want to call it joy or awe or wonder, in ways that evidently have lasting effects for some of the people, if not all of them. And we're not maybe so likely to go into space and see the little blue dot, but in a way, and I don't think in a you know, made up way, in a way, our meditation practice, right? It's like the people who have studied this, it's like even we had a close to a big storm today, not really, it didn't really hit, but a lot of thunder heads, a lot of grumbling of thunder, some lightning. But even uh, dramatic weather, big river roaring by or waterfall, really large, tall trees, right? This is probably ringing some bells. Some of you, like everyone thinks of, if you haven't been there, Muir Woods in north of San Francisco, an hour and a half or so. It's a national monument, and it's a really beautiful grove of redwood trees, coastal redwoods, which are very tall. And there's something sacred in that place But when we break it down, it's like you look up at those trees and the mind doesn't know what to do with that visual experience. It kind of breaks the narrative that, you know, the daily grind of our narrative that is on repeat. I mean, with some different riffs, but, you know, whatever. And you see big surf on the coast or you see tall trees or something that's a little out of the box and the heart lets it in and the narrative breaks down. And interesting, one of the things I read is the Greek word for ecstasy means to stand outside oneself. I thought that was interesting, right? And from a Buddhist perspective, that's a standing outside of oneself is the same as saying standing outside of delusion. Because right? the, the narrative, the self, selfing narrative, self-centered narrative, is the prison. And it's a resilient prison. And a lot of interesting stuff can happen in the selfing narrative can incorporate it. You know, We can even, the self can even use dharma. Well, that happens sometimes. Sometimes it's like this. And we just turn the Dharma into part of our self-centered narrative. That's why, you know, one of the uh, causes for joy is being surprised. It's like that's one of the essential aspects of humor, right? Or some musical traditions, like something happens you weren't expecting, and there's a little bit of 
Tripping Over Joy. I don't know if you've seen that poem. It's really sweet. It's a, a riff off of one of Rumi's poems by Coleman Barks, who uh, wrote many poems based on Rumi's poems. And one I really like is called Tripping Over Joy. And it goes like this. <clears throat> what is the difference between your experience of existence and that of a saint? The saint knows that the spiritual path is a sublime chess game with God and that the beloved has just made such a fantastic move that the saint is now continually tripping over joy and bursting out in laughter and saying, I surrender. Right Now, what's the other half of us? Whereas, my dear, I'm afraid you are still, I'm afraid you still think you have a thousand serious moves. Right? You see how, like even that poem, that sort of surprising ending on the poem, it can kind of uh, cause a little of that tripping over joy. Oh, maybe I'm that fool, that self-important fool that thinks, you know, in the remaining three days of the retreat, I have a, a thousand serious moves to make on my climb to the exalted heights of enlightenment where I will sneer down uh, at all those who are yet there. <laughs> I had a, my good friend in college, and then we lived together for a few years after college, did a lot of backpacking together. And uh, whenever we were backpacking in the mountains, he, he was fluent in French, and with a French accent, he would quote this French uh, mountain climber, I forget who it was, some famous, who talked about, you know, I, I, I won't be able to paraphrase exactly or say it exactly, but it's, it was that sort of sneering down at the grubbing masses below, you know, those who have gotten to the top of the mountain feeling special about ourselves. And uh, that's often how we, we think that joy comes from that kind of super achievement. And we can misunderstand, like even that whole Instagram culture where we're at Mere Woods and we're capturing the, the beauty of the trees or, you know, the stories of people falling off of cliffs wanting to capture instead of really understanding what's happening. Because if we understand what's happening, then we don't need to go to the Grand Canyon or the coast or the mountains or stand outside in an open field in a thunderstorm. <laughs> you know, playing with danger of one kind or another. Because it's just a matter of letting life surprise us. Like I mentioned, I forget exa exactly what I was saying. Oh yeah, when I was walking around the field, right? That was a moment of joy. Remember I mentioned that the other night and uh, walking around our beautiful field here at uh, Common Grounds Retreat Center it's just, it's about a 15 minute walk around the loop of the field. And uh, there about halfway through, caught my mind thinking about wanting to be in a beautiful space that I owned, <laughs> you know, that I could count on as being mine or something like that. I mean, it wasn't said explicitly like that, but that's basically what the fantasy was about. And then the mind just the weight of the absurdity of that and the, the sort of momentum of practice saw like just how incredibly ridiculous that is to be in a nice place, to be in the kind of place the heart desires to be in, wanting to be in a nice place. And there's that little tripping over joy and recognizing the tripping over joy you know, and like really being moved. And there's so much freedom. Now you would think like a lot of our habit energy, oh my God, I've been practicing for 40 years. 
and I'm still obsessed about wanting the perfect retreat place or whatever, you know, the perfect field to walk around. And I, it could be, you know, the cause for a lot of despairing. So this is a, a, an important clue about joy that any moment will do. And it's mostly about interrupting the narrative, the oppressive narrative, standing outside of ourselves. How can we stand outside of ourselves? And often that sort of basic or one of the basic Dharma moves is to allow the weight of the narrative to cause its own collapse, right? So that depth and breadth of presence, being present, recognizing this is how it is, like developing that momentum, right? It just becomes more obvious. I mean, I'm sure I'm not the only one online or here at the retreat center that have had moments of being intensely in some obsession, followed by a moment of recognizing the absurdity of that obsessive mind and how ridiculous, how funny it is. Tragic, funny, and how that obsession, as powerful as the vortex is, as likely as it will be that I'll be obsessed, lost in it in the future, in this moment, there's some sense of its ephemeral nature, that it ain't the whole truth as real as it is. And it's exactly that contrast, how vividly real the obsession, the flavor, the emotions of it seem and feel, and how empty of that solidity it is from this place of humor and wisdom. Here's another poem that kind of, in a different way, paints the same sort of picture from uh, Naomi Shihab Nye. Some of you know her, wonderful poet, Palestinian-American poet. Valentine for Ernest Mann. You can't order a poem like you order a taco. Walk up to the counter and say, I'll take two and expect it to be handed back to you on a shiny plate. Still, I like your spirit. Anyone who says, here's my address, write me a poem, deserves something in reply. So I'll tell you a secret instead. Poems hide. In the bottom of, your, in the bottom of our shoes, they are sleeping. They are shadows drifting across our ceilings the moment before we wake up. What we have to do is live in a way that lets us find them. Once I knew a man who gave his wife two skunks for a valentine. He couldn't understand why she was crying. I thought they had such beautiful eyes. And he was serious. He was a serious man who lived in a serious way. Nothing was ugly just because the world said so. He really liked those skunks. So he reinvented them as valentines, and they became beautiful, at least to him. And the poems that had been hiding in the eyes of the skunks for centuries crawled out and curled up at his feet. Maybe if we reinvent whatever our lives give us, we find poems. Check your garage, the off sock in your drawer, the person you almost like, but not quite, and let me know. <laughs> it's a sweet one. Yeah, so that's an important job for us. I know a <laughs> job sort of uh, contradiction, but it's like to be interested in joy and uh, to be really suspicious of whatever the narrative, like, well, there's, you're not going to find any joy here, right? Because that grind and the grind of retreat 
and the boredom and that sort of one of the most painful narratives that can get established in the mind. I mean, there's a lot. <laughs> this, would, this would be a, a place for great humor. Wait till the, you know, the last day when we share with each other, you know, and share some of these, like the different painful narratives that got established. But one of the real painful ones is nothing is happening. And part of that nothing is happening is this unconscious um, arrogant certainty, it's always going to be this way. I've somehow, even though I used to be sincere, or maybe I'm still sincere, somehow I must have taken a wrong turn, and I'm in this endless desert, and it's too late to go back and find my way, you know, but I, I'm pretty sure I'm just going to get gravel, <laughs> and not the interesting kind of gravel. You know, just the bland gravel, endless gravel, right? And it, it can feel, you know, another breath. We could try all sorts of things, and we just find gravel. <laughs> and it's and it's like that, uh, you know how sometimes our friends do the, the violin move, like, oh, sad song kind of thing? I mean, we need some little uh, wisdom response, like, oh, this is really hard. (laughs) You're really, really a suffering human being. I mean, you got that down. You really got it down. You have all the right moves. You know, the, oh, poor me, perfected. No one's done it better. Yeah, it's like uh, creative, out-of-the-box ways to call the bluff of the mind certainty, whatever the obsession, whatever the dark um, scenario that the mind is constructing. Strangely, uh, the ego gets fed in that. There's, There's such a wonderfully solid sense of self when we're so convinced we're screwed or we're bad or somebody's tricked us or whatever it is, betrayed us. We don't want to leave it behind. Same with our other kind of juicy stories about becoming and wanting, right? It's like that example I gave, you know, it seemed unconsciously more juicy to be wanting a nice place to be than being in the nice place. That's why it's called delusion. Right? It's so crazy. It's like uh, Ajahn Sumedho says in one of his little books, people this is a, a paraphrase. People think or imagine that they like peace and equanimity until they have peace and equanimity. <laughs> and then they realize it's not so much that you or I are addicted to the intensity of our self centered dramas, but there is that very natural feedback loop where the mind is feeding on the intensity of self-centered drama, whatever it might be. So we, you know, Shelley mentioned last night about wise effort and uh, talked about the four wise exertions, like learning skillful means for abandoning unwholesome, you know, states of mind that the mind has taken the bait so that the mind is entangled with. We need to learn how to abandon, to put it down, to disconnect. We need to learn how to prevent the mind from going back to those kinds of mind states. And we want to develop and maintain wholesome states. 
ultimately that's the best prevention and even way of abandoning unwholesome is to know how to develop and maintain wholesome states to find our way back to joy and just to, it's like a, it's a frame we can just operate with live our life with I strongly encourage you to take this up as a theme and just see what can be a cause for joy, a cause for delight. And it has to be real. You know, like just the comfort of bringing my leg under my thigh that I just did here, you know, and it's like, oh yeah, that feels good. I like that. For a while, it won't last, you know, in 10 minutes I'll want to move my leg again. <clears throat> And part of it is, is, is that we have to, um, <clears throat> like to get outside the box, the first step is somehow to open to the possibility that happiness is available and we're deserving of happiness. Like we don't need a different life or a different temperament, a different set of circumstances to be able to touch into happiness or joy or delight, or whatever. There's a funny story from the suttas of um, a monk, an older monk, who had been uh, kind of a king, or the head of his area, and had some real wealth, and had given it all up to become a monk and to practice with the Buddha. And some of the younger monks were kind of snooping around his little campsite where he was practicing and they heard him mumbling under his breath, what bliss, what bliss, what bliss. And they, they probably thought he was having like sexual fantasies or imagining being back at the palace or back in his nice home eating delicious foods or being, you know, getting, getting a nice massage or whatever. And so they told the Buddha, and tattled on him. And so the Buddha said, okay, well, go tell that person to come see me. And so they did. <laughs> you can imagine. Hey, the Buddha wants to see you. <laughs> <laughs> and so the Buddha says to him, when he came, you know, I'm, I heard that you've been saying to yourself, what bliss, what bliss, what bliss? You know, what's going on? <laughs> and he says, well, back in the day when I was the king, you know, I had... I had to have guards around my royal apartment, and I had to have guards throughout the cities, towns. I had to have guards throughout the countryside. There was always anxiety, always fear, always worry. I wasn't very happy. And then he goes, but now, you know, I don't have anything. I can't even store food overnight as a monk or a nun, right? You gotta you eat the food you're given that day nothing left over except, you know, medicine, but otherwise you can't keep anything overnight. You know, you just have a few requisites, a few possessions, sleeping under a tree or a simple hut. And uh, he says, my mind's like a wild deer, fearless, happy, unburdened. And that's why I say, what bliss, what bliss, what bliss. And the Buddha liked his answer, and at least as it got recorded, when the Buddha liked the answer, what someone said, he'd often restate it in verse. So having heard him say basically what I just said, uh, the Buddha gave this poem. He said, from whose heart there is no provocation, and for whom becoming and non-becoming are overcome, they beyond fear, blissful, with no grief, is one the Dewas can't see. Right? Even the angelic celestial beings, because the person exists as nature. There's no deluded self operating. It's like I mentioned in the small group, you know, with somebody, I think today, like just that sense of everything happening on its own. Not even somebody who's free, 
somebody who's experiencing bliss. And that's a nice way to get a sense of how joy can be really available at any moment and why it doesn't, why we don't need different conditions or circumstances to realize joy. Because what is the experience of joy? That lightness of heart, right? It's the absence of friction. So nature, the activity of the body, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, and the activity of the mind. See, normally when we think of nature, we think of trees and grass and deer. I just saw deer walking by. But that's seeing being known. And if I have any thoughts about that stuff, that's thinking being known. This is a mind world. Sorry to break it to you. And there's seeing being known, thinking being known, hearing being known, smelling and tasting being known, touching being known. That's it. And that's all activity. Thinking is an activity, it's a movement. Seeing is a movement. And the mind that is under the influence of greed, hatred, and delusion, or self-view, it has this almost magical way of concocting the experience of friction. No! <laughs> or yes! <laughs> you know? But it's, <clears throat> it's also manufactured in the heart, in the mind. There isn't actually friction as we subjectively experience it, but clearly, right, most of the day in greater or lesser degrees, we experience some friction, some resistance, some weightfulness, right? Am I the only one? <laughs> no, I don't think so, <laughs> but maybe. But for sure, for me, there is that friction. And then, you know, with practice, I've learned to be curious about when I'm aware enough to notice that there's friction, resistance, heaviness, tightness, then there's enough experience, cumulative experience, there's that voice of wisdom doesn't actually say anything, but it understands friction is an inherent to the system. Friction is a concoction. It's an imagining, and it can go away. So now, a lot of times when I say something like that, you know, that friction is optional, everyone, you know, we all think of a time when things were really difficult, some deep emotional pain or some chronic physical pain or some terrible thing that's happening in the world. And, the, and then we go, well, what about that? And whatever that, whatever's pointed to, internally or externally, it's a movement. It might be experienced as a really painful movement. But pain, when it's moving, without the mind resisting the movement of that pain, what's that experience? And I'll give you an example because a lot of you might recognize this example because you've experienced painful loss. Maybe a loss of a pet, maybe a loss of a parent, loss of a loved one, loss of a lover or a job. And you felt that loss and you resisted the pain of that loss because it was intense. But maybe you remember moments where there was the pain of the loss, that was real, but in moments, the heart stopped resisting that pain of loss. So it was just the pain of loss, which is a movement, an emotion, a movement of emotion, but no part of the mind in opposition to the movement of what we would call pain. So if you can remember an experience like that, was, is it right to call that painful? I mean, sort of it is, but it really feels enlivening and 
weirdly joyful. It's like when we're grieving some loss and in moments we just, the heart doesn't know anything better than to let it rip, it feels really good just to grieve in that sort of a bit, um, like non-resistant way. All the stops pulled out. If we have the wherewithal to look, to notice, to feel, we'll see, oh yeah, everything's moving. And for whatever reasons, the heart's given up trying to control what's moving, to define what's moving, to manage what's moving. And that feels good. We have this, it's strange, um, when we sit, one of the reasons we sit still as a form, it's not that it's the most comfortable posture sitting up, right? But it's, it's you know, and if it, if it is really comfortable, just sit longer until it's not. And then it's really interesting when it's really hurting the physical posture. And I'm not even talking about a specific bodily injury, just sitting still for a long time eventually starts to hurt. And, uh, and you can learn, you can really see this joy that I'm talking about where there's, wherever there's even a little not liking of the physical pain, a little resistance, a little need to distract myself, to get away from it, then it's hard to bear. But they will will bump into either because the mind has learned this or just even accidentally where there's physical pain and for whatever reason, the mind momentarily stops resisting the movement of that pain. And one place where you can catch this even without any Dharma skill is you're sitting and you're really overwhelmed by pain, you don't like it, and it's really un- unworkable and unbearable. And then the next thing you know, your mind's been distracted. Of course, when you were distracted, you would know. But then the instant you know you're distracted, you'll realize that the pain's not a problem. Because you, the mind was so absorbed in the distraction, it had to abandon its job of resisting the physical pain. Pain was still there, probably. I mean, the, the, the underlying cause for the pain was still there. The, mind's, the pain of the mind's resistance was gone, which is why we like distractions, absorbing distractions, right? They have to absorb us like a dream, right? That we're disconnected. And it's not even so much about as I said, being disconnected from the physical pain as much as it is being disconnected from the mind's neurotic attempt to resist, to defend itself, to define the pain as bad, or all the different ways it's trying to manage. Now, I I don't expect you to believe this, but it's really important to check this out about the availability of joy, even around pain. And the the other thing about pain, a little bit like a thunderstorm, we can be in awe of pain. You know, just the wonder of like how much, how yucky the body can feel. It's like watching, you know, a flood or something. It can kind of just sort of Have you noticed this when you've been really sick, really hurting? It's just like you get a little high. You can get a little high because the weight of our life is gone. You don't, you can't even like hold up your whole to-do list and hopes and dreams and fears because it's all consuming the pain of your illness or whatever it is. So maybe you'll hear somebody mumbling under the breath.
what bliss, what bliss. <laughs> so if we were to rewrite, uh, you know, the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path, it's, it's good to be able to visualize it, to feel it as a path of happiness. So instead of there is dukkha, there is this fundamental unsatisfactoriness, unreliableness, ungovernableness. It needs to be understood. It should be understood. It has been understood. There is a cause, this attachment to desire. It should be abandoned. It has been abandoned. There is an end to suffering. It should be realized, fully realized. It has been. There is a path, arduous path up the mountain. It has been fully developed. We could put it in terms of happiness. There is happiness, right? Like to be able to say with some confidence, there is release from all that burdens this heart. It's here and now. There is freedom. There is release. There's real happiness. This should be realized. There's a cause for this happiness. Right? The cause for happiness is letting everything move, letting everything be. Right? Not clinging. Realizing the heart that's not clinging. Realizing the mind that's free of clinging. And even if you're clinging, Realize the mind that isn't clinging to that clinging, that isn't constructing a problem around being an erotic human being. There's always a place to start. So even if we're neurotic about being neurotic, about being neurotic, about being neurotic, in that moment we cannot cling to that. Non-clinging, non-attachment, what moment would the option of non-attachment not be available to us? Tripping over joy. Happiness has been fully realized, right? There is this path to happiness and it's the happiness of living in harmony, harmonizing, we can do that all day long, harmonizing at home, those of you on Zoom, harmonizing here at the retreat center in our community living with kindness, sensitivity, taking care of all of us, including ourselves. We can have the happiness of calm, like the garden of our own mind and heart. Samadhi, it's like, honey, how can I take care of you? What can I feed you? Maybe I won't think about that thought because that's disturbing. Maybe I'll pay attention to this instead of paying attention to that. How can I cultivate stability of awareness, a beautiful mind. How can I cultivate a beautiful view? Oh, well, and we can understand the Buddha's view and try it out for size. It's all nature, just a natural process, causes and condition, conditions, everything happening on its own. Maybe I'll borrow that view for a while, give it a spin. So let's take a moment, let go of the words, enjoy the silence for a few seconds. <laughs> 